Hello all, I want to welcome you once again back to our lecture series. Today we'll be looking at chapter 8. Uh, this will be the second part of the lecture. Remember, in the first part of this lecture, we looked at various lipids and their classifications, including the functions of lipids. Today, basically, what we're going to be looking at is we'll be looking at the biological membrane, which, of course, is built from the basic uh, lipid bilayer and then proteins and other stuff coming into play. All right, let's take it off from there immediately without wasting time. The biological membrane. Uh, of course, every cell has a biological membrane. The biological membrane is the outermost layer that protects the cell and also performs other functions. Now, if this is the nucleus of the cell, particularly the animal cell is bounded by a biological membrane, we can call it the cell membrane, whichever way you want to call it, the cell membrane, the cell membrane, whichever way you want to, I'm going to put my NE here, okay, all right, so every cell, so eukaryotic cells have their membrane enclosed organ, now in addition to having this cell membrane for the viral cell, now organelles such as the, the nucleus and the mitochondria have their own organelles inside. So if this is, we usually say that the mitochondria is being shaped. The mitochondria itself is bounded by its own membrane. The nucleus itself is also bounded by its own membrane as well. Of course, every membrane is built on the same basic structure. So the molecular basis of the membrane structure lies in the lipid and protein components. The lipid and protein components are actually what makes it very special. Now, the basic function of the cell membrane is that it suppresses the cells from the external environment and also help in the transport of substances in and outside the cell. Remember, the cell membrane is what we call a semi-permeable membrane or a selectively permeable membrane, which allows some substances to pass without at the same time refusing others from passing through. Now, the interaction between the lipid bilayer and the membrane protein is what actually determines the type of function of the membrane. We know that the main function of the membrane will be either it will be either be a receptor or it will be a transport uh, in transport whereby it allows some substances to go in or, or, or not to go in. So the major force that is driving the formation of lipid bilayer is the hydrophobic interaction as usual. So hydrophobic interaction takes place those interaction between side chains of non polar groups is what we talk about the hydrophobic interaction. Of course, the, the, this biological membrane differs from the typical lipid bilayer because the bilayer does not contain the proteins. The bilayer is just the two lipid bilayer. But in this case, proteins are either interspaced or placed at the peripheral part of this membrane, as we're going to see. So a typical lipid bilayer is what we see at this point. Now, in a typical lipid bilayer, remember, that the polar head, or what you call the hydrophilic head, or the hydrophilic surfaces, will be in out the outside, facing the aqueous or water environment. Now, the hydrophobic cells will now be facing each other, away from the outside environment. And now, the interaction between this hydrophobic part is what we call that hydrophobic interaction, because these cells are made up of unsaturated fatty acid, saturated fatty acid, and then cholesterol, which are all non-polar at that at, at the tail side. So that is the basic the basic structure, just as we can see in the structure of a liposome as well. So it is built the 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 the, 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 the membrane, the, the biological membrane or the plasma membrane is built on the basic lipid bilayer. However, apart from the lipid bilayer, it also has proteins and some other things like the glycoproteins and the glycolipids that we're going to talk about. So the arrangement of this bilayer, of course, is held together by non-covalent interactions. Those non-covalent interactions include the van der Waals forces, which you call that the dispersion forces, or you can say the induced dipole forces, and then the hydrophobic interactions. Now, those are the interactions. So both the inner and outer layer contain a mixture of various substances. Remember, we have a lot of different lipids that are coming into play. Now, if you look at this beautiful structure, you find out that at the, at the middle here is where we talk about what? Where we see 
the hydro okay look at it here the non-polar hydrophobic core of the lipid now the heads here are the polar groups that contain it can be a carboxylate ion it can be a phosphate group it can it just all those polar groups that are part of the lipid that are that are that are polar are what we have on top of those plates so if you look at this if you look at the key here now so you can have this fingomyelin you can have them you can have the cerebrocyte you can have the ganglioside the phosphoacid glycerol and can even have the cholesterol so there's a mixture of a lot of lipids playing role in maintaining this typical lipid membrane it is not just one thing and that is what we talk about a mosaic a mosaic is a mixture of different things coming together to make a good layout of a beautiful flat plane that looks like a combination of different flowers and we're going to see this as we move on so bulkier molecules tend to occur in the outside environment while smaller molecules tend to occur inside the environment like i said again um both the inner and the outer layer contain a mixture of different lipids so what about membrane fluidity remember in part of the thing we're going to talk about in the lipid, uh, fluid mosaic model is that we talk about the fluidity of the of the membrane what brings about the fluidity of the membrane now the arrangement of the hydrocarbon interior of a barrier can be ordered and rigid or disordered and, and fluid now it depends on the concentration or the composition of the saturated fatty acid now the mixture of saturated and unsaturated fatty acid it will contribute to membrane fluid remember when we talked about the lipid we said the saturated lipids are rigid when you have so many of them they are rigid and that is why they have higher boiling and melting point so linear arrangement of hydrocarbon chain leads to strong rigidity it's much more rigid because they are compact when you pack them they pack in a compact manner there is no space given out now those that refer acid provide a kink because of the trans remember they form the trans isomer the trans conformation which brings a kink to them so they don't pack they don't pack completely so they leave open spaces so the kink in the hydrocarbon chain causes the disorder in its packing and this leads to greater fluidity which we see mainly in plants product of course membrane fluidity, fluidity is also again maintained by not just the saturated fatty acid but by also the by also the amount of cholesterol that it contains you know the cholesterol has a fused ring structure the fused ring structure maintains a strong type of order remember this is what we see in a typical cholesterol so this is a b c and d now the fused ring structure of cholesterol is rigid yes it is rigid and it stabilizes the extended stretch and arrangement of this saturated fatty acid through van der waals interaction now because you remember the first one of the uh, earlier pictures i showed you was that the cholesterol if i look at sorry the yeah the cholesterol is found at the hydrophobic core of the lipid yeah that's where you find them what is their function what they do is that they stabilize that hydrophobic tail and make them rigid so the concentration or the high amount of cholesterol brings about rigidity and at times it tends to play a role in maintaining the lipid fluid in the plasma membranes fluidity or the cell membranes fluidity so membrane fluidity in plants and animals now animal membranes are less fluid and more what rigid they are more rigid because there is higher concentration of cholesterol and what saturated fatty acid plant membranes have higher percentage of what unsaturated fatty acid than animal membranes that's why they are more fluid they are what more fluid the plants are more fluid so the presence of cholesterol is actually a characteristic of what animals rather than those of plants so members of prokaryotic cell are even more fluid because they do not contain appreciable amount of cholesterol or other steroid at all so types of protein what type of protein have you know the type of lipid we can see in a lipid bile in in a plasma membrane or in a cell membrane what are the type of proteins we can see now there are two main types of proteins we can see and then there is other ones which is less talked about let's talk about the first two the peripheral protein the peripheral proteins are actually found outside the cell they are loosely bound to the outside of the membrane either by polar interactions electrostatic interactions or both 
example is like the G protein. So what you see, if I have a typical lipid bilayer here, assume I have a typical lipid bilayer, let me have something like this. Let me try to draw up something very fast. That will not take our time. Okay, if this is my lipid bilayer. Now, a peripheral protein will be, will be found just hanging somewhere outside the outside the membrane, not passing through. Now, example is like the heterotrimeric G protein. Another type of protein we can take is the integral protein. The integral proteins transverse all the width of the cell. Now, okay, this is what we call, remember this is what? The peripheral. We call this the peripheral protein. Now, if I'm talking about the integral protein, the integral protein will span all through the length. The integral protein will span all through the width, rather, not the length, the width of the membrane. So this is my integral, and that's what we call the integral proteins. Now, there are other less common type of proteins, the iconic proteins, which actually form the alpha helix and the beta platelet sheet. Now, they help in anchoring lipid via covalent bond from cysteines or free amino acid groups on the protein to other several lipid anchors. They are lessly talked about, but the two ones we're going to talk about mainly are the peripheral proteins and the integral proteins. Anytime we are discussing the true structure or the actual structure of the plasma membrane, you cannot talk about them without talking about the peripheral and the integral proteins. All right. So this is a very good example of what it might look like. Now, you see, this is the hydrophobic core that is made up of those nonpolar uh, nonpolar areas, nonpolar tails, particularly the saturated and unsaturated fatty acid, the cholesterol, and all the rest of them. Now, if you look at this now, you see, rhodopsin here is a very good example of what? A, of a... Uh, we can, okay, we can call it transmembrane, but in this case, we call it what? An integral protein, spanning all through across the width of this. Now, the G protein, you see, the G protein is only found just on one side of the protein, outside, only at one side of it. So this one represents, now here is your peripheral protein, and this is what the integral proteins. So, what are the functions of these proteins, particularly we talk about? The two main functions of these type of proteins we see in the plasma membrane or the cell membrane or the biological membrane are number one, they mediate the entry of specific substances in and out of that means transport, transport proteins. And they can also perform a function in cell signaling and recognition, which we call them the what? The receptor proteins. So they contain specific binding site for extracellular substances. So now let us understand. The fluid mosaic model, I think, was proposed about 1972. Yeah. So the fluid mosaic model is that model of protein, is that model of the plasma membrane in which the proteins and the lipid bilayer exist side by side without covalent bond between them. Now, if there was a covalent bond between the lip between the proteins and the lipid bilayer, it would have led to a strong rigid arrangement without making the membrane fluid, but that is not the case. So the basic structure of biological membrane is that the lipid bilayer is that of a lipid bilayer that contains cholesterol at the interior with proteins embedded in the bilayer structure and then carbohydrate like the glycoproteins and all the glycolipids attached at the exterior as signaling molecule. So the term fluid mosaic implies that there is lateral motion. Now, there is lateral motion in which that some of those uh, components of those lipids can easily move side by side and change positions laterally without distorting the overall structure of the what biological membrane. And that is what we're going to see. This is a good example of... So if we're talking about mosaic now, look at this my mosaic now. So in this mosaic, there's a mixture of different colors. This is like a flat plane where you see a mixture of different things being used in making up, in making this beautification. We often see these things in big places or big uh, 
theaters where they use this to decorate the window. So you just bring a couple of different, this is like making your ties, making your ties very beautiful, bringing different colors of the ties and putting them together. This is what the lipid bilayer looks like. So if you look at it now, if you look at, we have several things that is making up this. Okay, let's start. First of all, this is the lipid bilayer. This is what, now if you look at from up, from the top view, if you have the top view of this, from the top view of this, you find that there are different stuff like the polar head of this uh, of this lipid bilayer. Now, within this lipid bilayer, you find the integral proteins that are masked completely or the length of this. And then you also find what the peripheral proteins that are on one side. Now, those integral proteins, like we said, since integral proteins are transport integral proteins because they can allow substances to either go in or go out of the cell. And then you see, then what else? So you look at the cholesterol, the cholesterol, we have them here. And then what else do we see? Another feature you see is that we've not, I talked about it a little bit, but we're going to see here now is that now these are the carbohydrate groups, either the glycoproteins or the glycolipid that are attached on top of these proteins that perform important roles in signaling and recognition. Some of them are attached on the proteins. We call them the glycoproteins and some other ones are attached on the head of this lipid bilayer. And we call them the what? The glycolipids. So this is what we mean by a typical fluid mosaic model structure of the biological membrane. It has a mixture of different stuff. And as you can see, these guys, these particular proteins can easily move. This one can move from here to here. And then this one can also move from here to here, making it fluid. So the structure makes this a completely fluid model. So, membrane transport. Let's now look at those functions of those uh, proteins we talked about in membrane transport. Now, passive transport would be the first thing we want to look at. Now, a passive transport is a type of movement in and out of the cell that does what? That does not require the expenditure of any energy. Process that will substance enter the cell without the expenditure of any energy in form of ATP. Remember, ATP is the currency, is the energy currency of the cell. So whatever you're gonna do, we'll be relying on using that currency as energy. Now, they are strictly driven by concentration gradient. Of course, they are driven by that concentration gradient. Of course, when you have a gradient, you roll down your ball, the ball rolls down spontaneously without having to use any energy. So this is what we mean by a by passive transport. So there are two of them, the simple diffusion and self-facilitated diffusion. The simple diffusion, of course, at this level of chemistry should have known, is a process by which molecules or ions move from regional of higher concentration through the region of lower concentrations. Now, through either a pore. Now, one thing important here is that in, in this case, no energy is used. No energy is used. And nothing helps it. It just goes in through any pore, any opening it sees, it just goes in and the concentration gradient, like I said, the concentration gradient drives it. However, the second one we're going to talk about is the facilitated diffusion. Now, it is also a passive process. There is no expenditure of energy. However, something begins to help. That's why we say facilitated. A carrier protein helps the substance being transported from outside the cell to inside the cell. Again, it does not require energy or it does not require energy or ATP. It does not require energy or ATP. But now a carrier protein helps that substance to be dragged inside the cell. So this is a very good example of a passive diffusion. In this concentration 1C1, there are a lot of these molecules and here there is less of them. So since there's a difference between them, there will be a flow of this molecule from this region to this region. This is a simple pass, a passive diffusion, whereby there is movement of molecule from region of high to region of low. So this is high and this is low. All right. So a facilitated diffusion, what actually happens here is that, again, there's a concentration gradient. Let's look at it. Now, there's a concentration gradient at this point. If you look at here, here has a concentration of about 5 millimolar. Here is less than 5 millimolar. So the concentration gradient is from this side across this side. However, it moves that way. But what happens here is that a carrier protein, which we call the glucose panels, is what forms a channel 
through which this glucose molecule moves in from outside the membrane of erythrocyte or red blood cell to inside of the mem to inside this erythrocyte or the red remember the erythrocyte is also called the red blood cell so this is a very good example of a facilitated diffusion now let's talk about the active transport still talking about membrane transport the active transport active transport here in this case substances are moved against the concentration gradient now anytime something is going to move against concentration gradient something must happen in this case metabolic energy is used in form of what atp so it involves the carrier of protein and it involves a carrier protein number one there must be a carrier protein and number two it requires an energy source to move the solute across a concentration gradient and that energy source is in form of atp now there are two types we're going to talk about the primary active transport and the second in primary active transport the transport is directly linked to the hydrolysis of high energy phosphate is linked to the hydrolysis of high energy phosphate which is atp a good example is the sodium potassium ion pump or what we call or we call it or the atp pump what the atp pump is transport sodium and potassium ion alternately in and out of the cell now in the secondary transport the secondary transport is only driven by the hydrogen ion concentration gradient or ph so a good example here is the proton pump is active transporter that creates a hydrogen ion gradient and the creation of this gradient would lead to the what the flow of the solute from one part of the cell to the other so we see a very good example so this is a very good example of the first one the primary active transport that involves the hydrogen of atp so in this is also called atp like i said now what happens here let's look at it remember we talked about atp some time ago even we talked about covalent modification as a way of regulating the function of an enzyme so this atp look at from the name s tells you that it is an enzyme actually now in this case what is going on see in this case this is three moles of sodium ion that needs to be transported now as this three moles of sodium ion is bound to this protein or sorry not protein atp bounds to this uh atp molecule and induces a conformational change look at what happens here now the protein binds on it and it this is one kind of conformational change that enables this product three moles of potassium ion to bind now that conformational change changes it again and makes this part of it to open this side is going to open look at it and the opening of this will lead to the expulsion of three moles of sodium ion to the outside of the cell this is what brings about sodium transport and I, I, at the moment this happens now look at what happened the moment this thing takes place it is now the protein here is still phosphorylated look at it it is still phosphorylated the moment is still phosphorylated here now what happens next the the two moles of potassium ion gets ready to get it now the moment this potassium ion binds now this will induce a conformation change. this change will result to what the hydrolysis of this phosphorester bond to remove this phosphate the moment this phosphate is being removed the covalent change happens again that this place begins to open and as it opens these three moles of sodium ion that was outside will now be transported in and the circle continues so this is the mechanism of action of the sodium potassium atipase pump as a very good example of a primary active transport in secondary active transport what is happening here now remember again like i said there must be the involvement of what a protein a transport protein now what happened lactose has there there's a high concentration of lactose already inside of course remember is against concentration gradient what it means that high concentration here let me remove one of these there is high concentration here and there is low concentration here so usually for, it's supposed to be high to low no but that's not what is happening here now look at what happens here in the like now there is the proton pump the proton pump pr pumps hydrogen ion from outside the cell from inside the cell to outside the cell and this pumping of proton creates this proton gradient this proton gradient what does it do it now activates this galactose panels this galactose panels is the transporter for lactose that this creation of this gradient now result to the what 
the transport of lactose from outside the cell to inside the cell. So this is a very good example of a secondary active transport, which is driven by what? By hydrogen ion gradient. That is what leads to the activation of this protein that now result to the transport of lactose across from low to high concentration against the concentration gradient. Now, the membrane receptors. Remember we said some of these proteins also act as membrane receptors. Now, membranes receptors are large oligomeric proteins with very high molecular weight in order of hundreds of thousands. A good example is the G protein. I talked about G protein earlier when I showed you the structure that G protein is a very good example of uh, a peripheral protein. The low density lipoprotein and then the human growth hormones. Now, I'm going to, we're going to be looking at only how the LDL, low density lipoprotein, does its job. The main function of LDL is to transport cholesterol and other is an other hydrophobic and fatty acid, which are basically hydrophobic. So the binding of biological active substance to receptor initiate an action within the cell. Initiate an action. And most of this action is a kind of covalent modification to an oligomeric protein. You know, most of these oligomeric proteins, like we said, they are what? They are allosteric proteins. So the moment there's a change in their conformation, that was also the, what is the requirement? There must be presence of a functional groups that have a three-dimensional conformation where what? The binding can occur. Ability of this binding site to provide a good fit for the substrate. Now, this action, of course, can be inhibited. Remember, any action of any enzyme can be inhibited or can be activated at any point in time. A very good example is what we see in the LDL. What happens in LDL? Now, for the LDL, for the LDL receptor, now if you look at this, this green openings is the LDL receptor. Now, now this is the LDL. What does LDL do? The LDL binds to its own receptor. In this receptor now initiates a kind of what? A kind of uh, conformational change that results to the formation of what? A specific vesicle forming. This is an endocytic process. So it forms the complex that is pinched off of the cell via endocytosis. That's exactly how this is being transported. So immediately remember this is the lipid membrane. This is this length is for what forms the lipid membrane. Now that is where we find this LDL receptor. So the moment LDL, this is the LDL now. The moment LDL binds, it now results to this conformation that results to the pinching up of this cells to form a vesicle. Now when it pinches off, it falls off into the cell and finally it is being released. And as it's being released, the LDL now releases the cholesterol. Because the function is doing is that it wants to carry cholesterol from outside the cell, you want to take cholesterol from here, outside the cell, across into the cell. That is the main function of this LDL. And it has to go through the LDL receptor. Now, again, like I said, when there is too much of cholesterol being transported by the LDL, uh, by the LDL via the LDL receptor, what happens? The oversupply of this will go back and stop the synthesis of more LDL receptor. This is a very good example of a feedback mechanism again. And this sigma mechanism is common, or it is, yeah, it is common for most oligomeric or, or, or oligomeric or allosteric proteins again. All right, so lipid soluble vitamins and their function. You know, there are four lipid soluble vitamins, I like giving them the name, I've always given them that name, the ADEG. You need to know them and you need to know their function. Vitamin A is a site for primary photochemical reaction. Photochemical. That means see. That's why it plays an important role in sight. That's why most people, when you cannot see, they say, are you deficient of vitamin A? But that is very, very important. Vitamin D, calcium and phosphorus met metabolism. The lack of this usually affects kids to have brittle bones and that leads to a condition we call rickets. Vitamin E is the strongest antioxidant known to man. It helps in warding off free radicals that come into the body as a result of what? The oxidation of saturated fatty acids in the body. Then vitamin K plays an important role in blood clotting. Very important role in the casket of blood clotting system. So let's look at a bit of what they look like structurally. So now vitamin A is actually produced from a precursor we call the beta carotene. The beta carotene looks like two of this vitamin A. And then some enzyme will break them together to produce vitamin A. And they are very rich in most of those yellow vegetables like carrots and palm 
some palm oil and a few other things that are yellow in nature, you get this beta carotene from them. So it's an extensively unsaturated hydrocarbon. The precursor, it is a precursor of vitamin A. It is found in plants in the form of provitamin pigment called carotene. The retinol, of course, is the rare form of vitamin A. It is enzymatically oxidized to the aldehyde group, which is called the retinol. Remember, vitamin A is called the retinol. So the aldehyde group, which is alcohol, of course, from the name, will tell you is an alcohol, of course, you know that. This is retinol from the name. It is oxidized to an aldehyde group we call the retinol. Now, the aldehyde group forms an immune skiff base in the protein obscene to form what we call the visual pigment called the rhodopsin. The rhodopsin too, remember we talked about the rhodopsin, the rhodopsin is also found in the plasma membrane and it plays an important role in the primary for the chemical vision. So this is actual structure of the retinol of vitamin A. We go to the next one, vitamin D. Vitamin D, the commonest vitamin that is more active is the cholecalciferol. So the group is structurally related compounds. The group of structurally related compounds involved in the regulation of calcium and phosphorus metabolism. The most abundant form is the vitamin D3, which is cholecalciferol. I said this already. It is further processed in the body to form the hydroxylated derivatives. The presence of this derivative leads to the increase in synthesis of calcium binding protein, which increases the dietary calcium intake through absorption. The deficiency of vitamin D leads to what? Rickets, or what we call the brittleness of bones. You know, the bones need a lot of calcium. And these are those reactions that take place. So the cholecalciferol is converted to dihydroxycalciferol. Then the travel, like that's what most of them say, when you go outside, it helps you to get vitamin D. This is the reaction that is being promoted when a child goes outside. Now, this will result to cholecalciferol, which is vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 will now also be oxidized again to 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, and then the most active form is 1,25-dihydroxycholecalciferol, and this can happen what in kidney. Another oxidation results to this active one. Again, at least you should know the structure of this most common form, vitamin D3, which is cholecalciferol. I will expect you to know only the structure of this in your exam. Again, you have to know the structure of your retinol. Vitamin E. Most active form of vitamin E is the alpha tocopherol. It contains antioxidant properties. It's, in fact, one of the strongest antioxidants, or if not the strongest antioxidant known to death. It's a strong reducing agent, which are easily oxidized, and thus prevents the oxidation of other substances. It traps free radicals. And of course, high, free radicals are highly reactive molecules that have at least one unpaired electron that are formed as a result of the oxidation of unsaturated hydrocarbons chains in the membrane phospholipids. So vitamin E, this is structure of the alpha tocopherol, the commonest and the stru most structural active form of vitamin E. This is a little bit, not a very bad structure to memorize, but I wouldn't expect you to memorize this for exam. Vitamin K. The main role of vitamin K is in blood clotting. People who don't, vitamin, who don't have enough vitamin K will find it difficult for blood clotting to take place and that could lead to a, a lot of hemorrhage. Now we used to hear about hemophilic disease whereby those people naturally have low, don't have enough clotting factors and they, most of the things what they use in, th in those kind of treatments is to give them enough vitamin K. So it is by cyclic system that contains carbonyl groups, the only polar part of the group in the molecule which is, which is this. And then it contains long isoprenide unit, long unsaturated hydrocarbon side chain that consists of the repeating isoprenide unit. This is the isoprenide unit. This is the isoprenide unit. So you just get this side and connect it to this. And this is usually a very long chain. So they exist in many, many forms. This is K1 is phylloquinone and K2 is menorquinone. Now let's talk about the last thing we'll be talking about in lipids, the icarotenoid. Icarotenoid, I didn't include them in the general classification of lipid I gave you. If you want to put them there, they're going to be diffused. Remember, I told you the fused ring structures are the cholesterol, the, the, the steroid hormones, and the bile acid. 
Now, the carcinoid that cyclic compound that synthesizes in the body from 20, from a 20 carbon icosan saturated fat acid, we call it darokidonic acid. Darokidonic acid is the first precursor. However, darokidonic acid is derived from darakidic acid. Darakidic acid is the long saturated C20 fatty acid, arachidic acid. So the arachidic acid goes a lot of enzymatic processing, which introduces these four double bonds that leads to the formation of this molecule that looks like a cyclic structure called arachidic acid. Remember, the introduction of a double bond leads to the kink. Now, this has four kinks. These four kinks makes it look like a ring, which it is not really like a, a ring, but it bends in such a way that it looks this way. We call this the arachidonic acid. Now, these guys are usually synthesized in times of trauma. So, following trauma, it is generated from phospholipid in the cell membrane by the hydrolysis of enzyme phospholipase A2. It then undergoes series of so many processes to produce these three classes of arcasinoid, the prostaglandins, the thrombosins, and the leukotrienes. You can call it leukotrienes, but it's triene. I will show you that in the structure. So look at actually what happened. This is the carcinoid production. So remember, the arachidic acid is modified to produce this. It comes from arachidic acid, forms the arachidonic acid. The arachidonic acid now undergoes different processing. Now, now it can be converted to the prostaglandin intermediate. This will further be processed by some enzymes to thrombosins, to prostaglandins, and to leukotriene. Now, the enzyme, some enzymes does the inhibition here. So, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug inhibit cyclooxygenase. It's the cyclooxygenase that converts arachidonic acid to this common intermediate. And then, arachidonic acid can also be converted to leukotrienes, and the leukotrienes can be inhibited by five lipooxygenases. So, we call this the lipooxygenase inhibitors. So, the lipooxygenase inhibitors can inhibit the action of five lipooxygenase that converts arachidonic acid to leukotrienes. Let's now look at them individually. Now, the prostaglandins were first, were first detected in the seminal fluid, which is produced by the prostate gland, and however, that gave them their name, prostaglandins, because they were first discovered in the prostate gland. They have five membered ring. Look at each of them. Have this five membered ring from them. And they control, their main function is that they control of blood pressure because they have effect of smooth muscle. They stimulate smooth muscle contraction. They induce inflammation. This is very, very important. They induce inflammation. You see what we have here? This is how you produce the primary glandin. This cox enzyme is actually what does what? What produces this? So if you can inhibit this, you can slow inflammation because prostaglandins induce inflammation. So aspirin, cortisone, and other steroids possess anti-inflammatory effects that can inhibit the COX enzyme that does this. The COX is the cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme, actually, that does this. Cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes. All right. So they also inhibit the aggregation of platelets, which makes them very good in controlling thrombosis. So they possess therapeutic value by preventing the formation of blood clotting, in the large blood vessels or thrombosis. So, and they are actually known by the modification of either by oxidation or reduction. You see, look at this differs from this because it has the double bond being moved. Up. This one has one double bond, this one has two. And then in this one now, this one, you find out that this has been completely reduced to OH group here. And then it is the PGE3. So, and their name, the PG means prostaglandin E1, prostaglandin E2, plus ingredient. E3A. The leukotrienes, like I said, they named the leukotrienes. They were first discovered in the leukocytes or the white blood cells, hence their name leuco. Remember, the white blood cells are called the leukocytes. So that's why we give them the name. They are not cyclic in nature, but they consist of three conjugated double bonds, hence the triene. Look at this double bond that are interspersed by a single one, by three successive ones. That's what we call them the trienes. Now, the main function is that they help in the construction of what? Smooth muscle, especially in the lungs. They can produce strong asthma-like attacks. They are highly bioactive in the, those smooth muscles of the lungs. They may have 
inflammatory properties and may also be involved in rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, then the tropozens. They are the third class of derivative of arachidonic acid. The structure contains a cyclic ether. If you look at it now, you find that this is an ether group, this is an ether group. That's how they look like. A good, the commonest of them is the thrombosin A2 or TXA2. Its main function is that it induces platelet aggregation and smooth muscle construction. Aspirin and other non steroidal inflammatory drugs inhibit their synthesis, inhibit the synthesis of, thrombo, of, thrombo, of thrombosins by inhibiting the cost enzyme. Remember, they inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme, like I showed you here. So, this is the thrombosin and this. Both this non steroidal interferon will inhibit COX2 from synthesizing these two. So, if since the cause serous, you know, activation or constriction of the blood vessel, so if you induce this non steroidal inflammatory drug, you can slow that inflammatory process. All right. So, having said that, this will be the end of this lecture. Thank you again for listening and do have a wonderful day ahead of you. And bye.